Uh, so we're going to be talking about the F distribution. And basically that is when we're doing problems that compare or do hypothesis testing, so I'll call that hypothesis testing, uh, with two population variances. So I'll switch colors here uh, and I'll say with uh, sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared. Now, this looks complicated already, but basically you need to refresh your memory with what this is. And if you totally don't remember what a variance is at all, go back to my previous lessons and, 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 and kind of like uh, refresh your memory with that because we're going to be talking about variances over and over and over again. I think the easiest way to talk about it though is to kind of just give you a simple example. Let's say we have two populations. So population uh, one. So these could be physical populations in the world or they could be you know, whatever subsets of your population. So population one might be United States of America. And we're going to compare that to population uh, number two, which could be, you know, United Kingdom, Australia, whatever. But it, it doesn't have to be geographic. It, it could be any kind of population that you have. So in this population, you're collecting data or you have something that you're measuring. So in your mind, I want you to keep, just as one example, I want you to keep it in mind that let's just talk about the concept of IQ, which is, you know, measure of, of intelligence, which I don't know if you believe in that or not. I'm not sure I do, but anyway, there's a test that you can measure IQ. You go and, and, and take all, uh, give everyone in population number one an IQ test, they're all going to get different values. And if you go and give population two the same IQ test, they're all going to get different values. Now we can take the mean of those values and come up with a mean for population one. We can get a mean for population two. But in we've done all of the, the work in the hypothesis testing in the past where we're comparing population means. So we've done all that. You need to go back and review that if you haven't, or if it's not uh, crystal clear in your mind. Now we're moving on into talking about the difference in the variance between population one and population two. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit more about that. So for population one, if we give them an IQ test, uh, there's going to be a mean value, an average IQ that comes out of that test, right? But you can also calculate the variance of the entire population if you gave the test to everybody there. And that would be what we call, uh, that's a lowercase sigma. So this is sigma one squared. Now this shouldn't be too much of a surprise if you followed me through all these lessons. This is what we call a variant. So you need to kind of keep in your mind, I'll just kind of go down here to the bottom and just say that if we're doing something like IQ, you know, let's say the IQ mean is, you know, I don't know, 85. Right? Let's say the IQ mean is 85. Now, obviously, if we give the test to everybody in here, uh, the average value we can calculate, but not everybody got the, the answer of 85. Some people are going to have a lower value, and some people are going to have a higher value. So some people are going to score lower than 85, and you'll have some people with really high IQs that are going to have higher. So from the, the raw data, you can calculate the mean. You can also calculate the standard deviation, which is kind of like a general idea of how spread apart your data is from the mean. So the idea of a standard deviation, if you remember, is how far on average the data is spread about your mean. And variance is just the square. That's why it's squared here. It's the square of the standard deviation. So when you're thinking about variances, you need to be kind of thinking about it's, a, it's an indirect measure of how spread your data is. It's just the square of the standard deviation. So keep that mental idea of the IQ test in your head as we talk about this because it's kind of nice to have a concrete uh, thing that we're, that, you know, to kind of discuss the ideas here. So if population one has a population variance, sigma one squared, then the same thing is going to be true over here. Population two will have the same thing. If we could give this test to everybody, then we could calculate the population um, standard deviation, right? So we could calculate the mean over here of population two, and from the data, just similarly to over here, we could calculate the variance of population two. Maybe the population two has a really, really wide you know, variation. Maybe there's some people that score really, really low and really, really high, and the variance is much bigger over here. Maybe population one has a lot of really, you know, uh, tightly packed data where it's everybody gets very close to the same score. Who knows why, but this is what we're talking about. But the idea is, is maybe your population one is 
a million people and your population two is a million people, so you can't give this test to everybody. So that in statistics, we, we, we can't give the test, we can't collect data from everybody, so what we do is we sample. So within population one, we, we want to understand what the population variance is, but we can't measure it because we can't give it to everybody, so what we do is we sample n sub one people. In population two, we do the same thing. We sample n sub 2 people. You see what I'm doing here? n sub 1 is how many people we give the test to because we can't afford to give it to a million people. And n sub 2 is how many people from population 2 we give the test to because we can't afford to give the test or we can't physically give it to everybody. Right? Now from this sample data that we calculate, we calculate a sample mean which is different from the population mean. The population mean is everybody. The sample mean, as you, if you remember from the past, is just the mean of the samples. So if maybe you give the test to 100 people, the sample mean is the uh, mean of those 100, 100 scores that you have. But again, we're talking about the variance in this. That's what we're talking about. The F distribution is going to cover and involve variance. So we don't care about the mean, we care about the variance. So from this sample mean, or I should say from the samples that you get, you calculate a sample variance. Right, which we call S sub 1 squared. So when we go and talk about populations, we use the Greek letter like sigma, that's lowercase sigma. It's population 1. The variance is we always it's the square of the standard deviation. That's why it's squared up here. But the sample variance is not the population. It's just how many tests we actually gave, maybe 100, maybe 200. And what we calculate from that is the sample variance of the data we collected. Now over here we do the exact same thing. We give the test to 100 people or 200 people and we calculate a sample variance. And because we're talking about samples, we call it lowercase s, uh, in this case s sub 2 squared. All right, now why did I go through all this stuff? I told you the title of this was the F distribution. Well, that's because the definition of the F, F distribution involves these ideas s1 squared and s sub 2 squared. So let me go ahead and continue and draw this line across and kind of give myself a little break here. Ultimately, we have population one, population two, and what we're going to end up doing a lot of is hypothesis testing where we're comparing directly these two variances. This is very similar to when we were doing hypothesis testing with two means before. We're just comparing two variances, and because of that we have to use a new type of distribution. So in this case, uh, I'll just write down here, our hypothesis test when we compare two variance, uh, variances like this, uh, we will be comparing, comparing two variances. And obviously, since we don't have the population variance, what we're all, always going to be really comparing uh, in our actual testing with the data that we collect is going to be the sample variance, because that's what we actually have. And from that, we'll make an inference about the population variances we've been doing all along. So the test statistic, the test statistic, right, is given to you, or is given to you in whatever book you're using, uh, is a parameter called f, we'll talk about it later, and it's very simple definition. It's the s1 squared, the sample variance from population 1, divided by the sample variance of population 2. So literally, I need you to, to remember what's going on here. You have a population you want to study, so you can't actually give the test to everybody, so what you do is you hand out maybe 15 or 20 or 50 tests, n sub 1 number of tests, you calculate a sample variance from population 1. You do the same thing, a different number of exams or whatever, you calculate a variance from population 2. All you do is you take the variance of population 1, divide it by the variance of population 2, that is what we call the test statistic, F, uh, we'll get into why it's called F in, in just a minute, but basically the numerator here, the numerator comes from the N1 samples that you did, right? And the denominator comes from, it's calculated from the N sub 2 samples. The reason I'm writing this down so much is because later on we'll figure out how we need to use this when we actually co construct our um, our, our uh, rejection regions and all the things that we do for hypothesis testing. So let's move up here and talk a little bit more 
about this. So you're going to be, when you read your book and your lectures and all this stuff, they'll be talking about degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom. There's a theory behind degrees of freedom and statistics and why it is done the way it is, but basically when you see DOF, uh, degrees of freedom, basically it's going to be the number of samples minus one. And we have actually encountered this before. Basically, the more samples that you, I mean, just think about it, the more samples that you actually, the more tests that you give, the more, more sample points you have, um, the better your data is going to be and the higher the number of degrees of freedom you're going to have. And that's going to influence what the charts and the tables and the, and the results actually are. So for the purpose of the F distribution type of problems that we're going to be doing here, basically you have something called the degree of freedom of the numerator. And by the way, when I say numerator, I'm talking about this test statistic I told you about. There's a numerator right here and a denominator, right? So we did n sub 1 samples to calculate this and n sub 2 samples to calculate this. So when you see the degree of freedom of the numerator, it's going to be n1 minus 1. And when you see the degree of freedom of the denominator, it's going to be n sub 2 minus 1. Now I know I'm kind of getting in the weeds with you a little bit here. Um, because you don't really quite understand where we're going yet because we haven't done any problems. But I need to explain to you what the F distribution is and how to use the tables before we can actually solve any problems. Bottom line is, you take N1 samples from population 1 and N2 samples from population 2. You're going to end up computing this thing called a test statistic. It's going to have a numerator and a denominator. To use the table for the F distribution, you're going to need the degree of freedom of the numerator. So all you do is you take how many samples from population 1 and subtract 1. That's the degree of freedom you use in the table. You're going to do the same thing for the denominator for the number of samples uh, from the denominator from population number 2. All right. Now, the title of the lesson is the F distribution. So finally, we're going to talk about what the F distribution is. So we'll say F distribution. Basically, it's a distribution that looks like this. It starts here at zero, and it goes up, and then down, and then has a nice long tail like this. All right. So as you move this direction, f is 0 right here at the origin, and f is getting larger and larger and larger off basically into infinity, although you don't ever really get to, to super huge uh, large numbers. Now when you look back in your, in your table for the f distribution in the back of whatever statistics book you're using, you're going to actually see a whole lot of pages uh, devoted to this. That's because there's a lot of different variables in which table you actually use. You have the degree of free freedom of the numerator, the degree of freedom, which is population 1, the degree of freedom of the denominator, uh, which is basically how many samples you picked from population number 2. And then you also remember for every single hypothesis test we do, you always have something called a level of significance. So basically, for the F distribution, the way it's constructed is alpha is the level of significance, level of significance. This level of significance is the same concept that we have in, come, you know, used in the previous hypothesis testing. Um, in the past, basically the level of significance is 1 minus the level of confidence. So if you're doing like a 95% confidence uh, on your hypothesis test, then 1 minus that level of confidence is what we call the level of significance. Now for the F distribution, the way the tables are always constructed is that there's this critical value right here called F sub alpha. That's this right here. And this is the value of F sub alpha. And that F sub alpha means that the area under the curve to the right always to the right for the F distribution, the way it's constructed, is where this uh, level, where this F sub alpha is. So if alpha is 0.05, which would end up corresponding to a 95% confident level of confidence in your test, 0.05, basically this area to the right is going to be 0.05. So the table is constructed that F sub alpha, which is kind of, is basically going to be the critical alpha that you're going to, the, the critical value you're going to use in your rejection regions for the hypothesis test, is basically going to be the value of f that gives you an area of 0.05 or whatever your level of significance is to the right. All right. So let's do a little bit of notes here about the f distribution. The first one, the f distribution is skewed to the right. <clears throat> 
Notice that it's different. The normal distribution was symmetric, bell-shaped. Well, the F distribution always has a big bulge here, and then you get a really long tail like this. The second thing that I want to point out to you, the values of F are always greater than zero. That's not true of all distributions. Sometimes you can have negative values and positive values, but the values of F here, since zero is here, the values of F are always going to be positive. And the final thing I'm going to point out to you is the shape of the F distribution is determined, that's DET, determined by the following two things. The degree of freedom uh, of the numerator, right, and the degree of freedom of the denominator. Now, we haven't done any problems yet, but basically the numerator of, of what we talked about, if you come back here, the test statistic that you're going to end up using here is this. It's just going to be the variance of population 1 divided by the variance of, or I shouldn't say the population, the sample variance of what you collected from population 1 and the sample variance that comes from population number 2. So when we say down here things like... Um, things like the shape of the distribution is dependent on the degree of freedom of the numerator, what we're really saying is basically this is going to be the number of samples of population 1 minus 1, the number of samples of population 2 minus 1. All right. So the bottom line is, I'll just kind of do a little summary here. We haven't done any problems in this section, but you know I like to introduce things without dumping you into a problem that you're just going to be confused by. Some of the stuff in this section is not going to be totally clear until we can actually wrap our brain around a problem. But what I want to point out to you here is that we have a new distribution called the F distribution. It's basically used when we're comparing two variances, when we're trying to do hypothesis testing with two population variances. But we can't give, test, or sample the entire population. We never can. So what we do is we sample n sub 1 number from population 1 and n sub 2 from population 2. From that, we calculate a sample variance from each population. You can think of that as the spread of the data about the mean of whatever it is you're talking about. We're talking about IQ here, but we might be talking about production plant A and B making pencils. And we could have the length of the pencils coming off of production you know, plant A and the length coming off of B. And we might be interested in comparing the variance difference in the two plants. Are the pencils on, uh, is the variance in the pencil length different from the two plants or not? So you might be doing a hypothesis test, for instance. We do hypothesis testing between two variances. We have to use a new test statistic and a new distribution. It's called an F distribution. The test statistic we'll come back to later, but it's just the, the, the division or the ratio of the sample variance of population 1 divided by the sample variance of population number 2. So then you have this concept of degree of freedom. It's just the numerator, or population 1 samples minus 1, population 2 samples minus 1, and then we end up using all of that information in looking at the actual F distribution, which is uh, skewed to the right, so it's not symmetric. The values of the distribution are always positive, and the shape of this distribution, in other words, right now I've drawn it like this, but if you have a different number of degree of freedom for numerator denominator, it might be slightly shaped differently. It may be have a taller peak or a little bit of a, a kind of a broader thing, but it's always going to be skewed. And so you're going to have multiple tables in your book depending on the degrees of freedom that you have and also the level of significance. And this critical value, F sub alpha, in the tables is always given to you uh, as being at the point where the level of significance is to the right the shaded region uh, of this guy to the right. So ultimately, when we do our hypothesis testing, we're going to be finding F sub alpha, defining our rejection regions, and calculating that test statistic that we talked about to figure out if we're going to reject or fail to reject our, uh, our hypothesis, our, our, uh, our null hypothesis. So with that, let me go ahead and conclude this. Welcome to this batch of lessons. I'm going to, in the next section, dive into the F distribution a little bit more, give you some examples of how to actually use it. This was just kind of an overview. And then we'll get into our problems. Once you get through the next few lessons, I promise it'll be very, very uh, clear exactly what we're doing because I'm going to show you every single step along the way as we learn the F distribution and these kinds of, of um, hypothesis testing and statistics. And then we're going to move on into analysis of variance, ANOVA, which is uh, basically what we're doing here but even more complicated. So make sure you understand the F distribution because when we get to ANOVA later on, you have to know this in order to understand that. So follow me through these lessons and we'll conquer every topic step by step. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.